the Jama Masjid was completed in 1656, which is uh, 16 years after the formal inauguration of the city. Uh, the city had several mosques, but this was Masjid Jahanuma, which was built by Shah Jahan. And uh, it is this mosque that was to later become the stereotype design for all mosques to be built subsequently. After this, anybody who built a mosque has tried to copy this. And the story that we hear that five times a day a Mohsen climbs the minar to call people for prayers has its origins here. Because before this, there is no mosque in Delhi that has minars from here. You climb that tower and shout, your sound doesn't reach here. Your voice does not reach the ground. It doesn't reach the courtyard of the mosque. And people in the courtyard don't have to be told because they know this is the time for prayer. Yeah. People outside have to hear. Nobody can hear your voice because sound doesn't travel like that. The minar is actually, Shikhar is in a temple or the steeple in a church because all ancient people believe that gods live above you. So you want it to go as high as possible to be closer to God. And in, in the case of Shah Jahan, he is deeply concerned about balance. So he had to frame his prayer chamber with the two towers. Before this, no mosque in Delhi has a minar, no mosque. All the mosques built by the Lodis, the Tukhlaks, the Khiljis, none of them. Architecturally, this is a phenomenal structure. In the, the total proportions, the balance, the domes, and this became an inspiration. So, um, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the founder of the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College, which became the Aligarh University, the mosque in, Jama, in Aligarh is a copy of this. The biggest mosque in India, to, to my reckoning, is in Bhopal, built by Shah Jahan Begum, the third ruler of Bhopal, third woman ruler of Bhopal. It's a copy of this mosque. The Badshahi Mosque in Lahore, which is thrice as large as this, is a copy of this mosque. And any number of mosques copied the design, outlay, etc. of this mosque. In, in terms of its conceptualization, it is beautiful in terms of proportion. And this is also probably the first mosque built exclusively with uh, sandstone and marble, which are two stones that virtually became the signature of Shah Jahan, at least in North India. He used a whole lot of material in Sindh and in Bengal and other places. Mughals used a whole lot of other materials. But all over North India, it is this. And you look at the size of the, just on these steps, look at the size of these. Look at this single slab. Look at the thickness. How did they bring the stone here? The closest where you get this stone is 200 kilometers away from Delhi. And it was built here because it is located on a hillock. This is the natural prominence on which this was, according to some people, known as Pahadi Jhojla. I don't know whether this is true or not. There is a Pahadi Bhojla. What is now the Meena Bazaar, this is a creation of the 1970s on this slope. But uh, originally, even at the time of the sacking of Delhi by Nadir Shah, there used to be a market on these steps. On these steps, especially in the evenings, people would come and all the three sides and the market would open. People sold all kinds of things, kebab, biryanis and, and kulfi. And this is where on these steps you came to listen to poetry. So Ustad Rasa, who was the disciple of Bekhud, would be stationed on that step every evening. And summer, winter, monsoon, he'll be dressed in a malmal ka kurta and pajama. And he would sit there. He used to have an extremely colorful language. It was so colorful that it can't be reproduced. After uh, Maulana Abul Kalam Mazad died, then that part, the, uh, towards the east of the mosque, east gate, east and northeast side, that was cleared up. That is where Maulana Abul Kalam Mazad was buried. So they created a small park there called Azad Park. And then they decided to remove all these shopkeepers from here and created the Meena Bazaar. 
below that. So that was, I think, late 60s or early 70s sometime, it, that market would have come up. The, there's another Mina Bazaar which is inside the Red Fort. There used to be a third market that connected the Delhi Darwaza of the fort to the Jama Masjid. The gate that is used now, that is the Lahore Darwaza. The Delhi Darwaza was the gate that the king used to enter the, the mosque. So therefore, the east gate is known as the Shahi Darwaza. It used to open only on Eid, Bakrid and Friday prayers. That gate used to remain closed because it was the royal gate. It's only now with this increasing pressure of tourists that they have begun to open that gate and they keep it open. Otherwise, it never opened. As the king came out of the Red Fort, there is a small roundabout in front of uh, Delhi Darwaza now. There used to be an octagonal park there with a fountain in the middle. And all around there was an octagonal market, which was known as Chok Sadullah Khan, Murakkai Delhi. It describes that market. And they were carpet sellers, people who sold birds, uh, palmists, astrologers, people who sold uh, aphrodisiacs, all kinds of oils to cure, cure your pains and all that. All that market used to be there. And when the king came out, he would pass through that market to come to the mosque. That market later spread out from across next to uh, Subhash Park up to the steps of Jama Masjid. And after the uh, Saur revolution in Afghanistan, whole lot of Pathans came and who started opening shops here. And they used to sell these magical halwas, the, which were supposed to be great aphrodisiacs. So the Pathans were selling it here. All that used to happen here till the 80s. And if you walk down, walk down the steps of Jama Masjid and walk towards Delhi Darwaza, some of those trades are still being carried out on the pavement. Whole lot of tribals used to come with their herbs and all that. Some of them still continue to. So this market has been here from uh, the, certainly from the early 18th century and probably uh, from the time that uh, the city came into existence. As you come out of the Shahi Darwaza, on the left there are two graves. One is of Hare Bhare Sahab and the other is of Sufi Sarmat Shaheed. Now Hare Bhare Sahab probably lived here in the time of Shah Jahan. I am not sure whether he was alive when Sarmat arrived here. Maybe he was already dead and his grave was there or he was alive and Sarmad pitched his tent next to it. Sarmad is the most more fascinating of the two. Hare Bhare Sahib was known as Hare Bhare Sahib because women who were childless would come to him to pray that they be blessed with a child. So, they would do their That's why he was called Hare Bhare Sahib.